So this, um, this psalm, Psalm 40, it's interesting timing. I always love, you know, God's timing on things and the way he works and, and at least brings things to my mind and, and things that I, you know, I meditate on these things and what to preach and, and just how things work out. It's amazing sometimes certain scriptures that we're focused on at different times, different things going on. It just seems to always fit so perfectly. And this week I had an opportunity uh, to go. I, I, was, I was sent an email from somebody who apparently is like an online listener and um, but they live in Georgia and, and they told me about this preaching conference going on and I actually meant to announce it on Sunday. I just, it just totally slipped my mind. But I was, I was, I like when there's opportunities like this to go to another Baptist church and it, it, it was a revival service they had going on. So there was uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday services going on. So I was able to make it out there on Monday night and, and listen and, um, and it was good. I, I love visiting other churches. You know, I love being able to, to congregate with other believers and, and kind of see how different churches do things. You know, there's always, everyone's a little bit different in their approach. And one of the big takeaways I took from that church, one of the things that just kind of stood out to me is, is how much, uh, you know, throughout the service, how much they were just praising the Lord and, and just being thankful for their salvation. They get, you know, the opportunity for people to give some testimonies and stuff. And, you know, I appreciated that. It was, it was nice. It's nice hearing that. It's nice seeing people just, just give, you know, praise to the Lord Amen. because he's worthy. His mercy endureth forever. I mean, we're going through the Psalms now. There's so many reasons to praise the Lord. And this Psalm especially, um, it, it, it hits home when I was preparing for this, especially after going there, just thinking like, man, you know, we're, I'm going to get into this a little bit later, so I don't want to. I don't want to steal the thunder too early. But it talks about God's thoughts towards us, and and you know how good the Lord is to us, and, and how amazing you know the the changes that God can make in your life, and the the truth that He gives us, and the directions He gives us to follow is all for our benefit. It's all for our good. He loves us. He cares about. He thinks about us. I mean, that's why we're here. You know, I don't want to ever lose sight. Why are we even gathering together? You know, you can, it can become too habitual to just fall into a routine and almost do things robotically, right? In the Christian life, you got all these things like, man, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. And those are good things. Look, I believe in having standards. I believe in making sure that, you know, we're trying to keep ourselves from sin and, and, and we're, we're doing as much as we can and, and trying to keep that. But don't let yourself just slip into just being in like autopilot mode and forgetting the whole reason Behind, you know, the, the spirit behind it, the Lord behind it. And, and, and it's not just becoming a set of do's and don'ts and set of rules, but, you know, we're serving a savior and should be excited about that and should be thankful for that. And, you know, as we read the scripture tonight, you know, let that sink in and just hit home. Verse number one, let's get into the chapter. Verse number one, the Bible reads, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. And this is one of the things I think that we need to remember anytime, especially when we're in trouble and we need help and we're seeking God to help us, that we wait patiently for the Lord because his timing is not always our timing. And we don't want to be too quick to run to the, to the answers of the flesh, to, to our, just our own uh, works and our own instruments to try to get things done when we're in help, but that we can patiently wait for the Lord to, to come in and, and not doubt and not waver and not lose our faith and not get discouraged, but that we wait patiently. Because the Bible says that he, you know, he hears us. There's a reason why Jesus Christ said, ask and you shall receive, you know, and, and that God is willing and, and listening and ready and wants to hear your, faith, your, your, your prayers unto him. And like he says here, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. We want to, you know, we want to be the children. I, you know, I bring up this analogy all the time because it's in scripture so much. It call, the Bible refers to the father, God, as being a father, right? And we know there's a father, the son, and the Holy Ghost, but we also know that we are spiritually born again. We become children of God through Jesus Christ and that we are adopted children and that, and that, that we have 
we, we become heirs and have an inheritance with the Lord. So there's nothing wrong about calling the Lord our Father also. And having that father-son relationship. And when we bring that up, I think of, you know, as us all being children, waiting for your father patiently. Right? Because we know how kids have a tendency to act when they want something. They say, I want it now. I want to give, give it to me now. I don't want this now. I don't want to wait for it, right? But the good child is going to be able to wait patiently. And you know what? The one who waits patiently is going to get the best reward, too. And the father's going to going to listen to them and incline their ear unto them um, and, and answer better for them. That's why I believe. Look at verse number two, the Bible says, He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. I mean, talk about the reasons to praise the Lord right here. And, and again, Psalm, we're reading this as it's written. We're reading this as the Word of God, but it's a song. The book of Psalms is a song book. And this is meant to be sung. And what great doctrine we have, but what great reason to praise. He brought me up out of an horrible pit. And this reminds me of the verse I was having such a hard time trying to quote this just before service today. John 5, 24, literally my favorite verse in the entire Bible. And I'm going, you know, just, just fumbling with it before service. But what, what I love about that verse, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into, in, into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And that last part of the verse is passed from death unto life. Why are we passed from death unto life? Because before you got saved as a sinner, you're headed towards death. You're headed towards hell. You're headed towards that horrible pit that the Bible refers to as the bottomless pit of hell. And that is what we deserve as sinners. And that's what we're bound to until you find Christ and put your trust in him, put your faith in him, and he frees you from that disastrous uh, punishment and he'll lift you up out of that miry clay and he'll take you from being headed towards death unto life and establishes you and sets you on that solid rock. And when your faith is on that solid rock, you can't be moved. Jesus Christ is that rock. He's the Savior. Hallelujah. What, what a great, what, a, what, I mean, words can't express how joyful that is to have that stability. You know, people are looking for stability in their lives. People are looking for the answer. People are looking for, you know, what can we trust? Some people choose science, right? And unfortunately, they, they turn to science that's falsely so-called and, and just into the ways of man and, and, you know, what's the best minds on earth can come up with. That's, that's not a very solid foundation. You look back through history, you know, people always have a tendency to think that the, the age that they live in right now, oh man, we're so smart. We're so smart. I mean, we know more than everyone that came before us. Start taking a look. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Look at how the science changes. Look at how what people knew as established fact, man, this is science, this is truth. How has that changed? And it's easy to scoff at people now looking backwards. How many things do you think are being taught as fact right now in 40 years, 50 years, you know, if, if, if the world lives, you know, exists that long, are going to be able to look back and be like, what fools? They were so ignorant back then. They didn't even know Fill in the blank. They didn't even know how much damage they were doing by injecting those vaccines into those kids. You know, whatever. Whatever, whatever the case may be, they're going to look back and be like, man, how stupid. That just shows you the shifting sands. That shows you the instability of trusting in anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But no, when you put your faith in God, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he sets you on a rock and he establishes your goings. He, he, he sets it solid. Verse number three, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. And, you know, I brought this up, I think it was last week. But this one verse here proves, you know, because there's multiple verses that talk about having a new song. And this restates what that new song is, even praise unto our God. So I don't think that the new song is just like a new psalm or a new spiritual song. I think it's new to the person because they're praising God. 
Because when you get saved, you know, when you're not saved, very, you know, your heart isn't just set on praising the Lord or whatever. You know, I mean, it's just not, you know, God's not in all their thoughts. <laughs> it's, it's not something that you're going to be thinking about. But here he's talking about, hey, the Lord has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. And that's a new song that you ought to have after you get saved. I'm not saying that every single person who gets saved automatically just has this happen. And you automatically have this new song in your mouth. But he's explaining here, God has put a new song in his mouth and it's praise unto our God. That's the new song. And then I love how this follows up. This verse finishes with, Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. And I think this gives uh, a great testimony to how much impact your changed life can do in the lives of other people and why it is so important to live a righteously sold out life for the Lord Jesus Christ and that it's not enough. Now, it's enough to be saved to put your faith in Jesus Christ, but it's not just enough for your life to just say, well, I'm saved. I'm just going to go off and live like the world and live like hell and just do whatever and not care, but that we ought to you know, do our best to live as sons of God and to walk in the light and to have a good testimony and to change and get the sin out of our life and walk in the spirit and, and do that which is right so that we can be that testimony unto other people that they can see, wow, man, here's someone that they definitely didn't have that song in their mouth before, but now they've got praise unto our God. That's different. What's different about that? Man, that guy used to love heavy metal. That guy used to love rap. That guy used to love the rock and roll. That guy just loved that music. He was singing that music all the time. But now all I hear him singing is praise unto God. Amen. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. That has a good impact. Don't get caught up in just the do's and the don'ts. There's a very good reason for this, right? I teach sold out righteous living and we ought to be examining our lives and try to make rules for ourselves so that we can, we can be very careful in what we do and, and, and try to get more righteous and, and, and get sin out of our life. But there's a very good reason for that too and it goes beyond just yourself and it goes even beyond just the chastisement of the Lord in your life. It impacts other people. It has a big impact on other people. And, you know, this verse isn't specifically talking about that, but along the same line is, you know, when people can just see, wow, here's someone who actually believes the Bible. Because it's evidenced by the way that you live. I know for myself that that was a huge impact on me when I got into Faithful Word Baptist Church. You know, I had been saved for seven years, but never really got plugged into a church. I got saved when I was 20 years old, but it wasn't until, you know, my mother was just trying to get me to go to a church, and I finally got fine. She found the church for me. I showed up, but you know what? When I showed up, it wasn't like other churches I had been to, and I'm not slamming other churches, but what, what I saw there was someone who actually believed with integrity of his heart the Word of God, and you can see it in the way he lived his life. And he didn't just say things from the pulpit. And then just go and do the exact opposite once church is over. Because sadly, I've been to churches like that before. Amen. Where you have people, they stand against one thing when they're here. But then you see their personal life and it's like, I thought you believed this stuff. And it becomes a joke. Right. And it's become big hypocrites. And then even if that person is a saved person, even if that person in their heart loves God, what good is that doing to people? doesn't have the same impact. But that had a huge impact. I mean, seeing someone like that had a huge impact on my life. Here's someone who's saying, we need to win souls to Christ. We need to preach the gospel. And you know what? He didn't just say, oh, well, I'm too busy. I'm the pastor of church. I've got family and a job, and I'm too busy. No. He said, come with me. I'm going Sunday. I'm going Saturday. I'm going Thursday. Come with me. I want to go. Let's go soul winning. Come with me and encourage and brings you and teaches you and trains you. That's a good leader. That's someone who's sold out 
to doing the right thing, that's someone who's going to have impact and influence on a lot of people. And it's not even because they're trying necessarily to have influence on people, it's just because they're doing, because they honestly believe and they're doing what's right. And it automatically will have that influence on others. When you see this isn't a joke, it's not a game to them, we're not playing church. It's a way of life. We don't come here just to say the right words. Hey, brother, hey, sister, glory, hallelujah. And then just the whole rest of the week, it's filth and smut and garbage and television and everything else. And then it's just, you know, you talk the talk on, on Sunday and then you just go home and every other day it's just exactly fitting in with the world. And if that describes you, shame on you, get right. Because we need to get right. We need to be an influence on others. We need to have other people see the new song in our mouth, even praise unto our God. And we need to do that so that many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Verse number four, blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. So you know who the Bible says is blessed? First of all, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Right? Because that's where you get that solid foundation. That's where you have that solid rock. But not just that, he's, he's contrasting, you know, trusting in the Lord with respecting the proud man. And, you know, I don't care what a person's title is. I don't care if they have the highest title in the United States of America. That proud man doesn't get my respect. Bible doesn't speak highly of pride. In fact, the Bible says that's Satan's sin. You know, I'm not, I'm not all for this pride, pride, pride. I don't care if it's national pride. I don't care what it is. The only, th the only thing we should glory is glory in the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Let him that glory, glory in the Lord. And blessed is the man that doesn't respect the proud and such as turn aside unto lies. Now, I'm not going to get on the whole political kick, but I mean, talk about turning aside unto lies. <laughs> I, don't care, I don't care what politician you're talking about. It's nothing but lies coming out of their mouths. It, don't, it doesn't matter what color they represent, what their flag is, red or blue or purple or whatever. It, it don't matter. You got, you got any politicians these days, you got lies coming out of their mouths. I got no respect for that. But also, like I brought up before, you know, the, the scientists, the people who are willfully ignorant and they profess themselves to be wise. Right? And they're going after lies. Lies like we come from chimpanzees and monkeys and we're nothing more than an animal. Stinking racist lie. Which is, that's exactly what it is, by the way. Darwin was a racist. And, and that's how he justifies racism by saying, oh yeah, people who are darker skinned, they're just closer to animals. And that's the view that's being promoted. And that's so-called science. It's wicked as hell. You know, the truth, the truth is that God has made us all of one blood. That's the truth. Verse number five. Man, I love this verse. And this is, this is, here's something to think about. Verse number five, many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. And, and that, is, that is a fact. You read through the Bible, think of all the works that you just see written in the Bible, let alone all the works that he has done. It's all the wonderful works that the Lord has done, I don't think are all contained in Scripture. But this is, I mean, there's enough, even if that were all <laughs> that he has done. I mean, the Bible says that if, you know, with Jesus Christ himself just on this earth, that the world cannot contain the books that would be written. That is, there's not even enough of that. So, but continuing on here, this, that's not, I mean, that's, that just starts us off here in this verse. And thy thoughts, so many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works, which thou hast done. So again, the subject so being many, and thy thoughts, which are to usward. So the Bible says that many are God's thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order 
unto thee. You can't even put them up in order about all the thoughts that God gives to us. He says, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Now, how amazing is that? When you consider who you are, just individually on this earth that's been around for thousands of years and all the people have existed and how low we are and you think about, you know, how rotten we can be and the sins that we've done against God when God has done nothing but good to us, when God has given us life, he's given us breath, he's given us food, he's given us clothing, he's given us all that we have. And if you're saved, he's given you salvation and given you forgiveness of all that. And on top of all that to think, we can't even number his thoughts towards us. What love. Let that come to mind. Memorize this verse against the day that you might start feeling depressed and lonely and sad and upset and you feel all alone. You start thinking about that God's thoughts to us word can't even be numbered. That's how many there are. That shows he doesn't, he's not the neglectful father, right? Like some fathers of this earth can be that can have their bastard children and never see him again and run off on them and go and, and worry about themselves and live a selfish life and not care about the child that they brought into this world. We have a heavenly father whose thoughts towards us can't even be numbered. That's something to, to, to sing praise about. That's something song-worthy. Imagine that. Maybe that's why we find it in the psalm. It's remarkable that God cares about us. And not just cares, but the extent that he does. He knows us intimately. He knows every detail about us. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. He knows everything about you, and he wants to know about you. He cares about you and loves you. And that's good to know. And you know, uh, on a side note, we go out and preach the gospel to people, right? We don't take the approach like the way of the master does, right? The, 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 what's his name? The Ray Comfort, false prophet, Ray Comfort. They spend all their time on the bad news trying to make people feel horrible and then tell people, well, Basically, you got you to live a good life and, and have all these works in order to be saved. And at the end of the day, that's what they're doing. They don't call it that. But that's exactly what they're saying. Is it important for someone to understand they're a sinner? Absolutely it is. People need to know that there's a judgment and the judgment day is coming and that, and that there is a, a just reward for your sin and it's the lake of fire. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. They need to know that. People need to be aware of that. You can't just think that that's not important. What do you need a Savior for if you don't even realize that your sin is going to send you to hell? You absolutely have to know that. But you know what else is, is equally important? People need to know that God loves them. And He has thoughts that are innumerable towards us. And that He loves you so much, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And while, yes, we need to make sure people understand the judgment, don't just gloss over and skip over the gospel. Because <laughs> that's what we're out trying to preach. The gospel isn't you're a sinner. The gospel is that God loves you and, and sent his only begotten son as a sacrifice to pay for your sins, for your errors, for your faults, because he loves you and he wants you to be with him. He wants you to be reconciled unto him. And that's some great news. Amen. The Bible says in Psalm 139, you, you, you can turn it if you like, Psalm 139, 17 basically is restating what we're seeing here in Psalm 40. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, in verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Again, just more testimony unto the, the innumerable multitude of the thoughts that God spends on us. Amen. Let that encourage you and lift you up. Amen. Yes, we remain humble. 
And we ought to esteem others better than ourselves, as Christ did. But there's a lot of joy and comfort. It, does, it doesn't mean that you just have to feel like you're beaten down and trodden. No, we're on the winning side, and we also have a Lord that loves us and sees us through every single step of the way. So while the path may be hard, while you may run into a lot of difficulties, while you may experience a lot of troubles, don't forget how much God loves you and thinks about you. That'll keep you going. Even if everyone else fails you, even, even if everyone turns their back on you, which has happened to many godly people in the past. Elijah had everyone turn their back on him. The apostle Paul even had, you know, hey, demons have forsaken me. I haven't loved this, precious, you know, this present world. He said, only Luke is with me. Oh, I got one guy with me. He had all these other people with him and they all forsook him. They all took off. They all had other things to do. How about Jesus Christ? You don't got a better preacher, a better leader than him. His closest disciples all fled from him. They all left. They all ran away. In his darkest hour, in the time where he would have needed them most, they took off. You know, the Father never leaves. Verse number 6, Psalm 40, verse number 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now, keep your place here and turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10, because if this sounds familiar to you, it should as being quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to see some of the, the, the light that the New Testament shines on Old Testament scriptures to help give us the, the full understanding of what this, the context and what this uh, passage is talking about here in Psalm 40. Because what we see here is a prophesying of future events taking place in the Psalms, as, as many of the Psalms do, by the way. The Psalms are quoted, I believe, more than any other book in the New Testament is going back in quotations from the book of Psalms. I mean, there's quotes from all over. There's quotes from Isaiah. There's quotes from Jeremiah. There's quotes from, you know, uh, just all throughout from, you know, the Old Testament, the saints, the prophets, excuse me, the, yeah, the prophets, the, the you know, the, the law. But we see lots of quotes coming from the Psalms, because there's a lot of prophetic messages tied into the Psalms. So Psalm 40, verse 6, 7, and 8 is, is basically quoted here in Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse number 1 of Hebrews 10. The Bible reads, we're just going to get this in context here. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, Make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, the book of Hebrews does an excellent job of explaining the transition from Old Testament to New Testament. Because there was a change in the law in the sense that the change, the order from, from the Levitical priesthood, which is what the law was about, and, and had ordinances surrounding the Levitical priesthood, which had the, you know, the, 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 the animal sacrifices and, and all of those other, what, what is commonly known as ceremonial laws. But the priesthood was changed. And Hebrews explains that, that now we have a priest under the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ being the high priest. And that because the priesthood has changed, now we, of necessity, there's, there's a change in the law. We're no longer offering animal sacrifices because those were all symbolic those were, those were symbols. Those were for the, the time then present. And they were, they were teaching and showing the coming of the just one, the coming of Jesus Christ. But that's, what, I mean, that's just a, a real high-level overview of kind of what Hebrews is doing. And that's why it's directed at the Hebrews. It's directed at the people who you know, physically were Jews or people who were in the land of Israel, that they were brought up with all of that. But now things are changing. They didn't know what's changing, right? How are we doing things different and why? And Hebrews does that. It's kind of a deeper book, but it's got great teaching in it. But one of the things I love about this is that it fully demolishes the notion 
where people think that people, there's a lot of people out there that believe that people actually used to be saved in the Old Testament by bringing their lamb sacrifice or goat sacrifice or whatever the sacrifices were, that somehow that saved their soul. But that's never been the case. That has never been the case and it never can be the case. Look, the blood of bulls and of goats, that being shed, that is not sufficient to pay for your sins. I'm sorry, it's not. It's not precious enough. The price is too low on a bull or a goat or a bird, or, you know, whatever it is, to actually pay for your sins. To actually make the eternal punishment, sin, debt, payment that you owe, that is not enough. And the book of Hebrews explains that very, very clearly. That's why verse 1 says, For the law, having shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers are unto perfect. Never means it never was able to in the past. It never will be able to. It's never been able to, to make the people perfect. But can Christ make us perfect? You better believe he can. Verse number two, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? He's saying, look, if, if, if the offering was able to actually make you clean and make you free from sin, then why would you need to keep coming back? What? Wouldn't they, wouldn't they stop being offered then? Like, hey, great. The sacrifice has been made. Done. It's paid for. Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It's not possible can't do it. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. He has to lay down this groundwork before going back and explaining Psalm 40. And explaining that, look, you need to know that this has never been possible to take away sin. Because even back in Psalm 40, he's prophesying the New Testament. He's prophesying the, 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 the just one coming and that he wasn't interested in the sacrifice and offering. He says, but a body hast thou prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come and the volume of the book is written of me to do thy will, O God. So these are the verses that are quoted from Psalm 40. Let's keep reading because he's going to give more explanation on this. Verse 8, above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not. And wouldest means he didn't want, right? So you didn't want the sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus Christ didn't come in this world just to, to perform all these sacrifices here on earth as like a priest on earth bringing in the lamb sacrifice and all this other stuff. That's not what God was delighting in. He came to be the sacrifice. That was the acceptable sacrifice. That was the one that really was being prophesied. That was the one. He came to do thy will. And you know, it was the will of the Lord. It was the will of God the Father that the Son would come and die and pay for the sins of the whole world. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's what Jesus said about his own death. Lord, if you can make this cup pass from me, right? Basically, if there's any other way that we can do this, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. And he humbled himself, suffering the death, even the death of the cross. And that was God's will. And he came to do thy will. And he took away the first, the Old Testament, that he may establish the second, the New Testament, the new covenant in his blood. That New Testament, by the way, which was always what gave the life. The law brought sin and the knowledge of sin brought death. No one's ever been able to keep the law. That's why we needed a New Testament. And that's why a New Testament was promised and prophesied of 
even going back to the law, even going back to Moses, even going back before Moses to Abraham. The Bible says that the gospel is preached unto Abraham. Read Galatians. You'll find it there. The gospel was preached before unto Abraham. And the Bible says that the gospel is an everlasting gospel. Let's go back to Psalm 40. So we see this great, this great prophecy of the sacrifice and offering. Thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou not opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Verse number nine. We know that this is talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews 10 makes that evident. I mean, there's no disputing that. It's not an I think, it's an I know because Hebrews 10 makes it clear. But I would say that that continues about Jesus Christ in the verses 9 and 10, even though Hebrews doesn't continue with the quotation. Hebrews 9, or excuse me, maybe I misspoke right there, I don't know. Verse 9 and 10 of Psalm 40 is a continuation of who this is talking about in verses 6, 7, and 8. So if I didn't say that right, I apologize, but that's what I meant. That, that's what I was saying in my head. If my words didn't come out that way, don't know. That happens sometimes. Get behind a pulpit. It'll happen to you too. <laughs> like, I'm not perfect. Amen. <laughs> We're serving one that is, but it's not me. So I'm going to try my best up here. Look at verse number nine. Psalm 40, verse number nine. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. You know what? Jesus Christ was a preacher of righteousness. There's a reason why he was hated. There is a reason. You know, I find it funny, people these days, you know, think that if Jesus Christ were around today, that everyone would just love him. Everyone, man, if Jesus was here, everyone would love him. And then when people hate you, they start thinking like, oh, well, I mean, it, you're, if you were more like Jesus, you know. No. They hated Jesus so much, they nailed him to a cross. They, they hated him. They conspired to kill him. He came unto his own. His own received him not. I mean, he came unto his own nation, his own kind. He came to them first. He gave them priority. He came unto them. And he came unto them humbly. He came unto them doing good works. But he also preached righteousness. He also called out their hypocrisy. He also called out all the sin. He called out all the wickedness. He overthrew the money changers' tables. He drove out those out of the temple that were disgracing the temple of the Lord who made it a, a house unto prayer for all nations and they're coming just trying to make money off of people. He was getting things right. Yeah, and upset a lot of people and made a lot of people mad. But that's what happens when you preach righteousness. Because the people who don't like righteousness don't like you. If you're preaching righteousness. Amen. The people that like to live in darkness don't like the light being shined on them. And that's a fact. They're going to run from that light. But you know what? That's our job. We're supposed to be children of light. The Bible said we're not supposed to hide the gospel. Right? We're not supposed to hide our lights under a bushel. We're supposed to let it shine. And that which you hear in secret preach from the housetops. Verse 9, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I haven't held back. I'm going to preach righteousness. You know what? I'm not going to hold back. Lord willing and, and Lord strengthen me because my spirit within me is going, don't hold back. Don't hold back. And you know what? You don't hold back. Preach the righteousness. Don't worry what man can do unto you. Man could do nothing unto you. If God be for us, who could be against us? Verse 10, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. It's also reminded me in the book of Acts. You don't have to turn there. Acts 20, verse 26 says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. 
Because the Apostle Paul said, you know what, I know, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, my hands are clean from the blood of all men. We ought to strive to be able to say the same thing with a good conscience. A good, clear conscience saying, you know what? People may be dying and going to hell, but it's not because of me. I've done everything I could. I preached. I preached righteousness. I preached the whole counsel of God. I didn't hide the parts that I thought that people were going to hate me for. I didn't hide the parts that, that talk about hell, the negative parts that, you know, oh, I might run, scare people off. I didn't hide that. I preached everything. Tell them all the good news. There's lots of good news. There's lots of bad news. But you know what? It's all truth. And we all need it. Every word. And woe on you when you think that you could become the censor of God's word. Where you're going to decide what people should hear and what they shouldn't hear. And well, I'm going to trim this message and I'm not going to say this and I'm not going to preach on that. Who do you think you are? God's the one that said that. That's God's holy word. And you know what? Shame on people who are going to call themselves Christians today. They're going to say, yeah, I believe the Bible. Yeah, I believe the Bible is the word of God. And then they're going to balk and they're going to run away and they're going to be scared when people bring up some of the laws in the Old Testament. And they get scared when, it, when the Bible talks about, you know, what, whatever, any of, the, any of the death penalties, any of the, you know, the, the people mock the Bible, want to mock the word of God. And say, oh, you believe that book? The one that says if a, if a child's disobedient, they're going to be put to death? You know what? I believe every single verse in the Bible, and I think it's true and righteous and holy. Amen. Every single one. Right. And the Bible talks about a stubborn and rebellious child that's a glutton and a drunkard, which is the example that's brought up in Scripture for that verse. Because, you know, people like to yank it out of context and try to twist the meaning of it as if it's talking about a, fo a four-year-old or something, right. which it's not. It's talking about someone who's a glutton, a drunkard, good for nothing. Their parents tried to, to discipline them. They're not listening to them. You know what? The Bible says that they ought to be put to death. And you know what I say? Amen. 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 Because you know what? The word of God is right and true. And if I think, oh, that's too harsh, I'm wrong. That's right. Because God said that it's not too harsh. God said that that's the law. Amen. Now, look, we don't, I don't preach that we take the law in our own hands and start doing this stuff. That this is what God has given for a righteous government to do. Right. And I will preach that till I'm blue in the face that that's what a righteous government would do. And the Bible even says when he gave the law, he said, you know what? The nations are on about you. They're going to say, wow, what a wise people. Yeah. That's true. You got, you got laws like that. Now, what are we now? The United States of America is a laughing joke yeah. worldwide. When, you, when you're letting perverts and pedophiles, these predators, go with, a, with not even a slap on the wrist and let him go out to go defile more children, that's a joke. That is not, that is not even close to justice. Right, preach it. Right. I hear you, preacher. Not even close to justice. That, that is so, you, you have to be so backwards in your thinking to say that anything other than a bullet to the brain is going to solve that problem. And you know what? The judgment of God is righteous, and I love the law of the Lord. Now, following the law won't save your soul, but the law is righteous. It's God's word. I'm going to stand firm on his word. And you know what? It's, it, the, God, the word of God is a dividing sword. It's a sharp sword, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's going to cut right through to the heart. And that's going to make some people mad. But you know what our job is? Our job isn't to judge the Word of God. Our job isn't to censor the Word of God. Our, our job is to preach the Word of God. And you know what you get to do? It's God's words, not mine. Because it's the truth. Now, I love them. I endorse them. I'm for them. But I didn't make this up. <laughs> it's not me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna have the audacity to stand up here and just tell you my words and expect everyone sitting here to always believe my words. Believe these words. Amen. If I get these words wrong, don't believe me. Believe these words. This is truth. This is life. Amen. 
Verse number 11. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. So, you know what? For the man of God, the child of God, innumerable evils may compass you about. Innumerable. And here, he's even talking about his own sin. He's like, you know, my iniquities have taken hold on me. I can't even look up. I have that humility. Understanding, man, who am I? And I've got evil surrounding me, but you know what? He says they're more than the hair of my head. But like Luke 12, 7 says, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. He just got done saying earlier in this psalm that we can't even count the thoughts that God has towards us. So even though you may have an innumerable number of evils surrounding you and may look like you're in despair, don't forget who your father is. Because he can see you through. He will see you through. He's there for you. Verse 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. The war that we're in is a spiritual, is a spiritual war. It's a spiritual battle. And when we have innumerable evils come to me about, we don't need to worry about righting all those wrongs and taking up arms against people. You know what? Bring it unto the Father. Bring it unto Him. He'll defend you. And I don't know about you, but I don't want anyone, I would never, what, not rather have anyone else defend me but the Lord. If I can put my faith or trust in any one person, I'm going to put it in God. <laughs> I'm not going to... I trust in God over the, the mighty might of the American military. I'm going to trust in God. Amen. I'm going to trust in God for even the smallest of matters, biggest of matters. That's where we ought to be. You know what? And, and don't be afraid. The psalmist here, David, is, is praying unto the Lord. Hey, let them be ashamed. Amen. They're trying to bring a shame on your name, Lord, and they're trying to shame the work that's being done. Let them be ashamed. Let them be confounded. They're trying to trip up, you know, these people that want to confound the work of God. Pray to God confounds them. You don't have to sit back and take it as when it comes to praying to God. You take the heat from the people that are dishing it, but we go to God and say, God, take care of this. Take care of this problem. You don't have to be silent about it. You don't have to take up arms, but you don't have to be silent about it either. You go, God... You got to deal with this. Amen. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Verse 15, let them be desolate for a ward of their shame that say unto me, aha, aha, you know, people just want to get you because your righteousness, aha, gotcha. Let them be desolate. Verse 16, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. And that last verse there, verse number 17, I think is just the theme, in my opinion, for this whole psalm. I'm poor and needy. Who am I? I'm nobody. Who am I? I'm a sinner. Who am I? I don't have any, I don't have riches. I'm poor and needy. I need God to help me. Yet, even though, I mean, because think about this. How does the world think about the poor and needy? They even want to look at them. In, by and large, in general, right? Poor and needy? You're not important. Get out of my way. But how does God view the poor and needy? I'm poor and needy. Yeah, God's still thinking about you. God still loves you. God's caring about you. God's got a special place in his heart. 
for the poor and needy, for the fatherless and widows, for those that can't defend themselves, for those who don't have the power in this world. He likes to show himself strong. The weaker you are, the more God can show himself strong in you. So don't be discouraged by being poor and needy. Don't be discouraged by not having all the talents or abilities or things that you think you'd want to have. Hey, let God use you. Yield yourself unto him and let him get all the glory. And take solace and comfort in the fact that even though you're poor and needy, he's thinking about you. He loves you. And he thinks about you so much, you can't even count the thoughts. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your love, for the truth, for your guidance, for instruction, Lord, for our salvation, for loving us enough to send your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, dear Lord, to die on the cross for our sins. God, thank you so much for, for who you are. We're not worthy of your love. We thank you for loving us anyways, Lord. And we want to dedicate ourselves unto your service. We're here to serve you, dear God. Instruct us. Teach us the right way. We know we're not perfect, Lord, but we're trying. Help us to, to have our steps just ordered and guided by you and by the light that you give from your word, dear Lord. Help us not to be the hypocritical believer the hypocritical Christian that we'd be turning people off based on the way that we live, but that we can truly have a new song in our mouth, praise unto the Lord, and that, um, and that we can have the best impact that we can on those around us, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.